the first talk in a series of six about different elements of language documentation. In this first talk, I'll be talking about the elements of a project, so what needs to go together in order to plan a language documentation project. Um, I'll also be talking about some more details of, uh, of planning in general. In the second talk, I'll be talking mostly about getting funding, so how to apply for a grant, where you can get money from for language documentation and things like that. The rest of the talks are more specific about what to do in language documentation. So the third talk will be the steps in a project and some examples of outcomes, so things that can arise from language documentation. In the fourth talk, I'm going to be concentrating on tips for community members who want to record relatives. So in the fourth talk, I'm going to be assuming that there's no large language documentation project or scheme. It's, um, it's a much smaller enterprise and, um, and that there are specific things that, um, that you can do in those, in those cases. Um, in the last two talks, I'll be giving some examples, first of language documentation, so projects that have succeeded and projects that, uh, that have uh, led to language documentation, mostly grassroots community projects. And then in talk six, I'm going to be talking about archiving and how to, how to archive language materials, where to archive them, and things like that. I want to start today with three questions in this first talk. And these three questions should be something that you should come back to several times as you think about what you'd like to do with language documentation. The first one is think about what do you want to do. So what sort of documentation would you like to make for your language? Now, it may be that you don't have a single answer to this question at this point. It may be that the reason you're listening to these talks is to get an idea about the possibilities for language documentation, and that's fine. Um, but I would start also with making some notes about what you think might be good ideas for language documentation. So for example, would you like to make as full a record of the language as possible? Maybe there's no written materials about your language. Maybe there's, there's if, um, if you disappeared tomorrow, then there will be no, uh, no record of the language. And so you want to write down as much as possible. Um, but maybe there are some recordings of your language and you want to focus on something a bit more specific, such as a dictionary or a website to tell other people about your language. Maybe you have an education program that needs more resources, so you want to focus on something from for the school, school worksheets, school uh, lesson plans, things like that. Maybe you're concerned about the stories that the elders know aren't being passed on, so that's what you want to focus on. Perhaps you want to work with linguists to do language experiments to, um, to see how your language uh, is the same or different from other languages. Or maybe there's something else. So all of these are part of language documentation and, um, and many other things besides. A second question is to think about what you can do given skills and training. So perhaps you have people with audio or computer experience or uh, film experience, and so you might want to make the most of that in your language documentation. Perhaps you have language teachers who can help with the, um, with the documentation process. Um, and so perhaps you have teachers who can be involved in the, uh, in the preparation of school materials. Um, if you don't have that, maybe you want to focus on something else. Okay, so think about what you want to do and how that meshes with the current skills that people have in the team that you want to put together. And thirdly, you should think about what's feasible given the time and money available. Of course, we all want to do as much as possible, but it might not be possible given, uh, given what's available in terms of resources to start off immediately with a full documentation of the language. But it might be possible to start off with something a bit smaller. Okay, so, um, so I would think about these as, um, as a, a checklist, a list of things that you'd like to do, things that um, are most appropriate for the skills and most feasible given who is available and what time and what money. Um, are available. Okay, let's now think about some elements of a language documentation project. These are the different issues of a project that you should think about before you start. So again, you might want to take some notes and think about how these particular elements apply to your language. First of all, uh, people. People are by far the most important part of any language project. Without the people involved, there's there's no project, um, and 
In terms of qualifications of people, I'm going to say that the only qualifications that are needed for, um, for a language documentation project ultimately are enthusiasm and a willingness to learn new things. You don't need a huge amount of training before you start. You don't need um, a linguistic PhD in order to document a language. There are lots of stories of people who have done wonderful work in language documentation with only enthusiasm and a willingness to learn new things. However, just like, say, in building a house, anyone can build a house, but with some training, it's a lot easier, it's a lot less frustrating. It's that's also true for language documentation. So talented people will do very well with or without training, but training makes it easier and makes it more likely that you're going to do a better job and a more long-lasting job. Um, and so this is where linguists come in for, for language documentation. You certainly don't need to work with a linguist um, in order to document your language, but linguists are trained in, out in how to make documentations of languages. And so that makes it easier for, um, for a project to, uh, to succeed because they've got someone on the project team who can think about all the different ways in which language comes together as part of a documentation. Linguists also have access to funding, uh, specialist equipment, high quality recording equipment, other resources, other linguists who've documented languages, and so on and so forth. So while you don't need to work with a linguist, um, I would recommend either getting some linguistic training or partnering with, um, with a, a local linguist to, um, to do some of the work. And um, I'll have some suggestions on where to find linguists a little bit later on. For the people for your project, you can make a list of who's around, who's going to be involved in the project, and then think about what each person is good at. So everyone has different skills. Some people are much better at some things than, than others. And so you can assign tasks once you have a list of things that you'd like to do as part of your documentation project. You can match them up with the, with the people who are involved. That'll make it easier to make sure that everyone's doing something and to make sure that everyone has something that's appropriate for their skill level. The second element of a documentation project is money or funding. Now, it's certainly not true that every project requires a large grant from the National Science Foundation or the Australian Research Council in order to, to succeed, and there's been plenty of work that's been done with quite minimal funding. However, there are some things that you're probably going to want to buy as part of your language documentation project, and so having access to some funds can be very useful. Um, so, for example, you might, need, you might need some equipment, video recorder, audio recorder, um, a microphone to go with those recording devices, uh, storage, portable hard drives, DVDs to back up the materials that, uh, that you've been recording. You might want to pay people for their time, um, in which case you'll need wages as part of the, the grant, part of the project. Um, publication costs, and there are many other. Once we start talking about funds and, and costs, there are many different ways in which money can be spent. So this should also be something that you should think about. Now, of course, funding depends quite a bit on what you want to do and how many people are involved and so on and so forth. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next talk. Uh, so talk two will be entirely about funding, where to get funding, what to budget for, and so on and so forth. Thirdly, you'll need some infrastructure You'll need a place to do the work, the language documentation work. Now, this doesn't need to be a specialist building. You don't need to rent space. It could be someone's kitchen table. It could be outside. Um, I've done quite a bit of language documentation work on the beach in northern Australia. Uh, but you will need somewhere to, uh, to make the recordings and, um, and to do the work of the project. You'll also need somewhere to store the materials. You'll be creating quite a lot of resources, quite possibly. And so you'll need somewhere to so store those safely. And you'll need somewhere to archive them, uh, to back them up so they're not lost. So that should also be something to, to think about. Fourthly, I strongly suggest you think about tasks and the workflow for a particular project. Now, workflow is just a fancy term for what needs to be done in in a particular order. So some tasks need to be done before other tasks. So for example, you can't do a dictionary of a language before you have a writing system for the language. And so a workflow involves uh, putting the pieces of the different pieces of work you need to do together in the right order. Now, 
I want to suggest that planning to document your language is perhaps too overwhelming a task. So documenting a language can take years, decades, hundreds of years. The Oxford English Dictionary has been going for several hundred years and it's still not done. Okay, so, so documenting a language on its own is probably too large a task to, to think about without breaking it up into smaller pieces. Um, but if you break it up into smaller questions, you can then get a handle on the specifics that you'll need to do. Okay, so for example, what types of language will you record? Do you want to record conversations? Do you want to record speeches, uh, stories, narratives? Um, all of these sorts of things are, are things to, to think about. And so each of those could become a subproject. Uh, you want to think about how you're going to record these uh, these types of language. So will you have an audio recorder? Will you have a video recorder? Um, are you going to get people to write things down? Okay, these are all questions that you need to consider. What will you do with the recordings once you have them? So how will you store them? How will you back them up? Where will you archive them? Now the third talk in the series is all about these sorts of tasks and workflows. So we're going to talk about more of those issues in, in the coming coming talk. Okay, that's the meat of language documentation. Finally, you should think about timelines. Do you have a deadline for making these recordings? For example, did you promise a funding agency? Did you get a grant and did you promise the grant that you would do some uh, do some of the work within say a year or two years? Perhaps the speakers of your language are very old and so you don't have a firm deadline for language documentation, but you want to make sure that you do as much as possible, as soon as possible, before the last speakers pass away. You also want to think about, for timelines, whether your plans depend on each other. So, as I mentioned, you can't publish a dictionary until you have a writing system, and you can't publish a dictionary until you've collected the words. Um, so you need to think about the, the order of things, the order in which tasks will occur. Uh, that's part of the timeline as well. So the workflow consists of interfacing between the time component and the task component. Um, another example is, of course, you can't publish a website with recordings from oral history until you've actually made the recording. So these are simple examples, but you get the idea. Okay, so for the first part of this talk, just to summarize, these are the elements of a documentation project, and these are the things that you want to think about. So the people, who's going to do the work? What are they good at? Money, how much money will you need? What will you need to spend the money on? Infrastructure, where are you going to make the recordings? Where are you going to do the work? How are you going to store the material? Where are they going to be, uh, where are they going to be stored? Um, fourthly, the tasks and workflows. What are you actually going to do in the project? Um, what pieces of the project depend on other pieces and so need to be done first or later? Um, and finally, the timelines. So do you have a deadline? Uh, do you need to do things in a particular order? Okay, so with that, let me move on now to some tips for planning a project. So these are, again, going to be pretty general things. I'm going to talk more about the specifics in future talks, but um, I think it's good to think about these general, general ideas for language documentation um, before we get too involved in the, the nitty-gritty of how to how to do a language documentation. Um, so first of all, um, I've already mentioned this, but I want to mention it again because I think it's pretty important. Don't try and do everything at once. Okay. So I've seen I've seen this happen a number of times where documentation projects have started with really high aims, really general aims. So I'm going to document my language. I'm going to make a complete record of everything that everyone said. Um, and so these projects start with really high aims, and they start with really with a, a huge amount of enthusiasm, and then they collapse when there's nothing to show for it before the initial interest wears down. So they, they do quite a bit of work in the early stages, but there aren't any outcomes to show for it. And so people get discouraged. Um, they think they're not making progress, and, um, and so the, the interest wears down, and so things, things fizzle out a bit. Um, I don't want to see that happen with, with other projects. And so one way to avoid that is to think of relatively small but quite specific things that you can do. And so you'll be able to see, you'll be able to do those and you'll be able to, to make progress and see that you're making progress. And um, other members of the community will also be able to see uh, what, um, what a huge amount of work is going into this project and also how, how you're succeeding in your project as well. And that can be very important too. So in order to do that, start small and build up. 
So I'd suggest not starting with a dictionary. Dictionaries are huge. Dictionaries take years. They take 10, 20, 30, hundreds of years to, um, to complete. They're, dictionaries are never done. That's, that's the problem. There are so many words in, in every language. There's so much information you can give about them. Uh, there's so many different ways to, to organize a dictionary that, um, that they're never, no one's ever happy with the, the final result. There's always more to, to put into the, um, uh, always more to put into the dictionary. So that's maybe not the best place to start. Um, one good place to start, however, is an alphabet book. Um, so this is just one or two words for each letter or each sound of your language with pictures to illustrate that. Okay, so these are um, by definition small, fairly small books. Um, they're self-contained, they make it pretty easy for um, new readers to start learning how to read the language um, and uh, they allow you to, to build on that for something else. So another area to start with, perhaps if you already have a writing system for the language, would be some word lists for different, um, different meaning areas. So you could do a book of parts of the body or a book of local plants and animals. These are great for school children um, or for, for getting started and seeing how things are going to work. So for example, here's a, a book that, um, that started as a word list and has now moved into um, a full documentation of plants and animals. So this is Wagiman, Plants and Animals. Wagiman is a language from uh, the central part of northern Australia. Um, so from your word list, from your just list of, of, of items, say for plants and animals, you could then give some more information about them. So you could say what they're used for, what the plants are used for, where the animals are found, where the plants are found, where, where, where they grow in the local community, uh, what's edible, what tastes good, what tastes bad, uh, how to prepare each of these. Um, plants and animals for um, uh, for use, whether they have ceremonial use, if that's appropriate to talk about, um, who owns them, if uh, plants and animals have specific owners, and is that appropriate to talk about? Uh, you could talk about stories that um, that have these plants and animals in them. Okay, so from from a, a word list from say even five or ten different plants and animals, you could build up to a whole book. Okay, so you see why why it's important to start small and build up, and also how easy it is to expand once you have a foundation to, uh, to work from. Okay, so that's the second aspect. Third aspect is don't reinvent the wheel. Plenty of people have been doing language documentation for some time now. So you wanna find out what's been done already. You don't need to start from scratch. You don't need to feel that you're working on your own. Um, so first of all, I'd suggest finding out what materials there are for your language. Find out who's worked on your language in the past if someone else has, has already worked on your language. You can do this by Googling your language name, uh, looking for academic work. So if you go to scholar.google.com and uh, type in the language name and um, look for linguists who've worked with your community, you might be able to contact them. Uh, you could visit local archives, local libraries, university libraries, and see if there's information there about the language. You could ask the linguistics department at your local university if they know who's uh, if they know if someone has language materials for your language, or you can leave a comment on the LCAT site and someone will get back to you uh, if, there's, um, I if they know of, of any information about this. Okay, so you can start with seeing what, what has already been done. And um, I say that the linguistics community in general is pretty happy to respond to community requests for language materials like this. Um, so, so certainly don't be shy about asking. Uh, secondly, I want to suggest that uh, you want to have a look online for what others have done in doing language documentation. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples in talk five of this talk, but um, there's, there's a huge amount available online, and I've got some suggestions for further, uh, further information as well in this talk and um, in some later talks as, um, as well. So see what other people have done and see what, um, what ideas you've got, um, uh, what might be appropriate for your community. Um, I've given one example here. This is a picture of Bruce Began. Um, he's a Bardi man. Bardi is a language from the far northwest of Western Australia. And he's holding the book um, Our World, Bardi Jaru Life at One Arm Point, uh, which is a book uh, about language and culture that the school did to, um, to document Bardi Jaru language and, um, and culture. So this is part of a, a much larger language documentation project, but this is one piece of, um, of this, and it's been very successful. Finally, no, second finally, um, I'm going to suggest that 
some projects have so much planning that they never actually start that there can be quite a um, if not a fear of starting but a tr bit of trepidation shall we say um, that people spend so much time thinking about what they're going to do and um, worrying about the right and the wrong way to do things that they never actually get very far in the documentation project. And so I I'd like you to be aware of that and I'm going to suggest that this don't, don't be scared, sometimes you just have to start. Um, some people also find that working with a language project, um, working on documenting their language when it's never been documented before can be quite overwhelming. It's very emotional and it's because it's so bound up in identity that this can be a very a very important part of um, a, of, of uh, a person's maturity. Um, it can also be, as I mentioned, very emotional and quite overwhelming. It can also seem that there's so much to do and it's going to be so impossible to to do a good job that maybe it's not worth doing anything. Um, I want to discourage thinking about that. Sometimes you've just got to start. Sometimes it's and you're going to make some mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes in language documentation. That it doesn't matter. It's much more important to start to learn along the way and um, and get the most out of the out of the project. So certainly do some planning. But if you feel like the planning is starting to drag on, that's a very good sign that um, that it's time has come to to do some experiments and to just to, to start and see what's what's going to happen. Okay. So so keep that in mind. Uh, lastly, these language materials that you're going to be making, like the language records, are really valuable, right? That's why you're doing it. You're doing it because you're worried that the language is, is in danger, is not necessarily going to be passed on, and so you're concerned enough about that to, to make recordings. Therefore, you want to be pretty careful with the materials that you've collected. So you might want to send the copies to an archive, and we can. I'm going to talk about archiving in um, in one of the later talks. Um, archiving doesn't mean giving the language away; it means keeping it safe. Okay, so um, so I, I want to flag this right from the start that protecting what you've done and um, taking care of the materials is just as much a part of a language documentation proce process as making the recordings in the first place. This means things like not relying on online storage. Don't rely on websites, particularly free websites, but also paid websites. Um, don't rely on them being available down the line. Okay, so we'll come back to that in later talks, but I did want to flag that from the start. Okay, so just in summary, um, we want to break projects into small pieces so that we can see what's being done. Uh, we want to start small and build up. As we saw, it was very easy to get projects that are going to be very, uh, that are going to become quite large quite quickly. So we want to start small. We want to see what others have done, both on the language, if possible, and in terms of language documentation. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, don't be scared. Jump in, start. Um, things will be fine. Um, and finally, protect what you've done. So take care of the uh, materials as well as um, as well as planning for the recordings. Okay, so next time I'm going to talk about getting funding. So how to get a grant, where to look for grant applications, what goes into a grant project, what to do if the application fails, and um, and so on and so forth.